Good morning. Thank you all very, very much for joining us. Welcome to our conference, Advancing Immigrants' Rights in Massachusetts, Connecting Research and Action. We have been planning this conference for over two years. I can't tell you how excited I am that this day has finally arrived. We're thrilled that you're here. A lot of people worked on this conference, and I will thank them all at the end. But I want to pause for a moment to thank, um, from the bottom of my heart, the Massachusetts ACLU and MIRA. Uh, thank you for your participation in the Partnership for Immigrants' Rights. It's been an adventure. Thank you for your tremendous support of this conference. This was a team effort, and it has been a joy working with you. To all of you who are joining us from beyond campus, beyond the partnership, we know you're extraordinarily busy people, and we will do our absolute best to make this conference worth your time. My name is Elizabeth Ennin. I'm the director of the Program on Human Rights in the Global Economy, uh, known by its initials, Fergie. We are housed at the Northeastern University School of Law, and we, we manage the Partnership for Immigrants' Rights. Just to get you oriented, as you know, we are going to have two sessions today. The first will be about picturing collaboration between community organizations and academics, then we'll take a break, and then we'll break into smaller groups to discuss those sorts of collaborations. Closed captioning is enabled. You may need to turn it on on your end to see closed captions. Slides will be available. You will receive an email in a few days from Eventbrite telling you that they're available and giving you a password that will allow you to access them. We are recording the picturing collaboration session. We will not record the discussing collaboration session. That's a safe space for you to speak freely. Please save your questions from picturing collaboration for the breakout groups in the discussing collaboration section. Thank you for that. So my job is to provide a bit of an introduction to get things rolling today. So let's start. You in all of your community organizations doing the tremendous work you are doing have your own goals. Today is all about thinking about whether academic research could help you better achieve the goals that you have set for yourselves. How could we help with academic research? How can we help you achieve your goals? So research can help, for example, identify and document needs in your community, demonstrate that unmet needs lead to serious harms, convince legislators and funders to take these needs and harms seriously, and identify, implement, and evaluate solutions. This is what we offer as a hypothesis for you today. We think that these um, research can help you do all of these things, and we would like to see if we can help you uh, put together some research that can help you do these things. So today is all about collaboration between community organizations and academics. How can we together produce the kind of research that can help you all achieve your goals? So as you know, we'll start with picturing collaboration, take a break, and move into discussing collaboration. Under picturing collaboration, we'll start with a brief introduction to the Partnership for Immigrants' Rights. Then I'll offer a few comments about collaborative projects in general. And then a group of Northeastern academics will provide you a sample of their research and a discussion about tools that they can offer that might be of use to you in your work. When we go to discuss collaboration, we'll start with guided discussions, uh, guided discussions about community academic collaboration. And then we'll open it up and have a discussion about sharing information about your groups, if you would like to share information about your goals, your organizations, addressing questions you might have about the conference or about anything you've heard, and brainstorming. Who knows, maybe even brainstorming potential projects. We want to acknowledge right at the top that you all face extraordinary resource challenges. No time, no money. And we understand that this might all sound a little optimistic to think that you would somehow have the time to collaborate with an academic researcher on a project, but we will try to address that as we go today. There are ways we can address those challenges. The Partnership for Immigrants' Rights. What is it? It's a group of immigration advocates and Northeastern academics. We've been meeting for a few years. Our mission is to promote the human rights of Massachusetts immigrants, and one of the methods that we use is collaborative research designed to support the goals of immigrant advocates excuse me, immigration advocates and community organizations. So our members in the partnership are immigration advocates and Northeastern academics. I'd like to introduce them to you briefly. So our current immigration advocate partners are the ACLU of Massachusetts and MIRA, the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition. People who have joined the partnership from these two groups are Laura Rotolo from the ACLU of Massachusetts, whose vision for this conference guides me every step of the way. It guides us every step of the way, and I'm so grateful for it. 
Amy Grunder, who was an original member way back in 2017, and I'm so grateful for her, and recently joining us and doing a lot of work for this conference, Sarang Sekhavat and Mariana Dutra. Thank you all. From the Northeastern University, we have academics in various areas. We, we cover a lot of ground, criminology, Latinx studies, law, public health. So in criminology, we have from the Center on Crime, Race, and Justice, Amy Farrell and Carlos Cuevas. From Latinx studies, uh, Latin, Latinx, Latin American and Caribbean studies in particular, we have Isabel Martinez. From the law school, we have from the Program on Human Rights and the Global Econi Economy, Martha Davis and, and myself. From the Center for Health Policy and Law, we have Wendy Parmet and Maureen Butt. And our immigration experts are Hamant Gundavaram and Rachel Rosenblum. From public health, from the Institute for Health Equity and Social Justice, we have Danielle Crooks, Alisa Lincoln, Tiffany Joseph, and Carmel Sahi. And you will be hearing from many of those people in just a few minutes about the sorts of tools that they can uh, offer to help you with your uh, organizational goals. So let's talk for a moment about picturing collaborative projects in general. The main theme here is that variety is, um, is an option. We, we can do all kinds of different things. So we just wanna help people be able to picture um, what might be on offer here so your imaginations can start to turn about and think about what might work for your organizations. So collaborative projects can range in complexity from very simple to very complex. The starting point could be a community organization who comes to the partnership and says, hey, we're interested in this need in our community. Can you help us think about how we might uh, get clear on that need, for example? Or a Northeastern academic might come to a community organization and say, I'm applying for a grant. Would you be interested in collaborating on some of this research with me? Or can I take into account some of your needs as I fashion my grant? The starting point can be a general conversation or a well-defined request. Your involvement as a community organization can be limited, perhaps at the very beginning, or you can be involved every step of the way in certain kinds of collaborative work. The time frame: some projects could be very short. Some projects will take more than a year to set up funding and set up the project and then execute the project. One way we keep costs down is to make use of the incredible students here at Northeastern University. We have used graduate students, undergraduate students, and law students in partnership projects. Uh, they serve as very, in varying roles from interns to research assistants to co-op students. And at Northeastern, a co-op means you have a student full time for about three months. The students participate uh, in short projects or cement, semester length projects or in things called capstone projects or practicums, and you'll hear more about that later, our funding models. As I said, students are one way we keep our costs down. Collaborative fundraising is also a possibility. So we can come together with an organization in the community and put together a joint grant application with funding uh, in the grant application for your staff members so that there would actually be time funded to collaborate with us. The partnership itself will always be looking for funding both in from inside the university and from foundations. The sample tools, uh, this is a list, I'm not gonna read it out. It will be in the slides for your reference when you get them, but these are the sorts of tools you will hear about in a few minutes from all of our academics. I'd like to turn it over to Laura Rotolo right now to say a few words. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and welcome everyone to this conference that has been um, a couple of years in the making, actually. I just wanted to give my sort of view from the advocacy world um, and a little bit of history. When Elizabeth came to Mira and said ACLU at the beginning of the Trump administration, I said, how can we help? We can do some research. We have a project idea. She pitched an idea that she'll talk about later. Um, and that idea grew into a multi-year project. And then as part of that, she said, you know, there's all these amazing academics I work with they're interested in helping too, can we get together? And so we had a few first meetings around, a, in, you know, in person back then around a very long table where I got to meet um, academics that were in many different fields at the university and all really interested in helping the immigrant population in Massachusetts and beyond. And Mira and ACLU, we got to sort of peek behind that, you know, that academic curtain and see the research that they had been working on for years. And we got to start to participate in that research and have this like amazing back and forth that you don't usually get between academia and advocacy, where 
advocates were able to ask for specific research to meet our goal, to be able to make the case for the bill that we were trying to pass. And the academic community got to see the real life um, impact of their work. And so it became this really amazing collaboration and we thought we need to share this with the world. Others should be part of this. Northeastern is such an amazing resource and really wants to do the work for immigrants. So let's share this with the world. And that's where this um, conference came about. Um, and we hope that you will get some great ideas here, make some great connections with the Northeastern um, academics and researchers, and that this research will really help your advocacy to sort of supercharge your work mm -hmm. with the data, the facts, and the research that um, you might be needing. So thank you again for coming, and thank you to Elizabeth for really you know, birthing this idea. Thank you very, very much for those kind words, Laura. Um, now we are going to look at specific projects that academics at Northeastern have done or ideas they have that might help you picture collaborations with academic partners. And so without further ado, we'll start with one of four buckets of uh, tools that we're going to look at. The first is program planning and evaluation. The second is community partnered research, then legal tools, then working with and using data. So starting with program planning evaluation, I'd like to introduce Elisa Lincoln and Amy Farrell, who will be talking about the NU Public Evaluation Lab. And uh, just let me know when you want the slides forwarded. Great. Thanks so much. And uh, Lisa, I'm happy to start this off and you can join in uh, when you'd like. Um, so really quickly, Elisa, do you wanna introduce yourself? No. Sure, so I'm Elisa Lincoln. I am the director of the Institute for Health Equity and Social Justice Research and with Amy, one of the co-founders about the public evaluation lab that she's gonna to talk to you about. Uh, my own background is sociology, public health and primarily mental health and social inclusion. Um, you'll hear more from me later. So I'm gonna hand off to Amy. Thanks, Amy. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, my name is Amy Farrell. I'm the director of the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice and um, the co-director of a lab you're going to hear about later when Carlos talks about it with the Violence and Justice Research Lab. And Lisa and, uh, Elisa and I are, as she mentioned, also uh, co-founders of the of Northeastern Evaluation Lab. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thanks. Um, and so we, you know, one of the things that this lab does is uh, Alisa and I basically, with some other faculty at Northeastern, um, started this lab a few years ago when we really recognized the value of doing the importance of doing evaluation research in, um, for community stakeholders in, in the Boston area and beyond, um, and the challenges that organizations faced being able to afford evaluations, being able to do high quality evaluations within budgets and providing um, you know, really good training, technical assistance and standards for a broad community of stakeholders around uh, what evaluation is. Um, so just really quickly, I don't think I need to tell everyone in this room any of this, but, but uh, the, you know, there's a lot of value to program evaluation. Increasingly, we're seeing program evaluation being mandated by grants, um, being mandated in funding streams. Um, but, uh, you know, outside of those sort of mandates to evaluate the work you're doing, evaluation that's done well really helps stakeholders make uh, data informed decisions about, you know, the degree that a program has the impact that was intended reaches the outcomes that were intended and, and is worth the cost. Um, so, you know, it, it makes sense to evaluate programs in order to continue uh, justifying their existence or maybe changing them uh, so that they better meet outcomes and impacts that you're intending. And ultimately what we're trying to provide resources for through the Public Evaluation Lab is uh, better understandings about how and why programs are effective. So it's nice to know that your program reaches the outcomes that you hoped it would, um, but it's important to understand why. How did you actually get there? Which parts of your program are most effective? And how can we elevate and more efficiently ensure that programs uh, do the things that we hope that they will do? Um, all right, great. And so the Public Evaluation Lab is one model that we have uh, helped create uh, to, to actually provide that resource in the Boston area. This initial funding came for the lab came through the university. Um, and it's a collaboration between a variety of different research institutes uh, that Elisa and I are part of and that other faculty members are, are part of across the, um, the Bouvet College of Health Sciences and the uh, College of Social Sciences and Humanities at Northeastern. Uh, we have a strong partnership with the School of Public Affairs um, and the Office of City and Community Engagement. Um, and we also uh, provide service learning opportunities to undergraduate and graduate students. 
But the overall mission of NewPel is really to build a community and academic partnership that improves the well-being of communities and the people living in them by creating a, a network of evaluators who have skills and capacity to provide evaluation resources uh, to programs in the Boston area and beyond. And to do that, um, we are trying to leverage the power of students <laughs> who are learning to be evaluators and to leverage the power of faculty and to leverage the power of university resources to create what we think of as an interdisciplinary, multi-generational lab that is training students to do evaluations that can be done in communities oftentimes for uh, less expensive price tags than a potential professional evaluation might be done in other quarters. Um, and, and ultimately drawing across a, a wide range of evaluation strategies uh, that are going to ultimately help agencies increase the impact of the work that they do. Um, and so we, we really focus on a few core uh, foundational principles, culturally responsive evaluations, um, theory-based evaluations, community-based participatory research. We use mixed methods, both quantitative and qualitative practices. We train uh, and build capacity for evaluations among students and also within the evaluation community in Boston. Um, and we work on professional development to improve evaluation methodologies, um, both uh, locally and nationally. And here's just an example of some of the community partners that we've had over the last few years. <laughs> so we've had lots and lots of partnerships. Some of these have been large funded projects. Other of these have been free evaluations or small projects or partnerships that have leveraged a health equity intern or a student to work on an evaluation, um, but across a, a, a wide range of stakeholders. And so we wanted to bring this idea um, to the partnership and think about ways that members in this partnership community could utilize the evaluation resources of NUPEL for your own program evaluations or for programs that may be being developed um, in the area. All right. And, and so again, just the last slide is, um, we talked a little bit about the fact that we work with these partners that I just demonstrated through uh, both culturally uh, responsive evaluations and community-based uh, participatory research, which means we're very engaged with these partners while setting up research to plan, build the evaluation, implement the evaluation, and actually report findings. Um, and one of the neat things about the new Pell is also that it's connected to coursework at Northeastern. So we actually have a uh, graduate level course techniques of program evaluation. Um, we have a capstone, a practicum, and we have health equity interns. And within all of those learning environments, we've actually situated partnerships with community partners to do free or low cost evaluations while students get learning opportunities that are structured and scaffolded by faculty with evaluation experiences. So those are a few of the, the ways that we could be involved with your organizations or others to help build capacity around evaluation. Thank you very, very much. Um, that was very helpful. Our second bucket is community partnered research and we have two presentations here. The first one I will be um, work from Elisa Lincoln and Carmel Sahi, community-based participatory research. And I believe I'm turning it over to Alisa now. You are. So uh, thanks, Elizabeth. And thanks, Amy, for that really great uh, kind of overview of the things we do at NewPel. Part of, uh, of that evaluation work also does draw on community participatory approaches. Um, as I said, I'm from the Institute for Health Equity and Social Justice Research. And there's some wonderful colleagues on this call who are also connected with our group. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about community-based participatory research. Uh, as I look at who's on this call, I'm guessing some of you uh, have already been engaged in this kind of work. Um, but for those of you who have not been part of these participatory action research processes, oh, go back one. It's a collaborative process that equitably involves all partners in the research process and really recognizes the unique strengths that each brings. Um, I won't read the whole definition. We at the Institute talk a lot about elevating different types of lived experience and sort of thinking about that in the research and scientific process. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So, you know, how do we do this? Uh, participant researchers are trained in scientific research methods. Uh, we often... Uh, most always engage a cross-training process. So uh, stakeholders train academics in lived experience and other types of knowledge. And also there's training in scientific research methods. Um, it's You think about using uh, the worldview of community partners to frame research questions and to think about design. Next slide. 
Uh, it's collaborative. It's a mutual influence process. I would actually go as far as to say when it's done, uh, sort of, I think, and often at its best, the academic partners really become consultants to the community. Um, but not every community organization can start there. Um, infrastructure issues and other things often mean that we start in other places. Um, research is strength based and it allows for lots of different kinds of methods. I'm actually part of a group now thinking about how to bring community uh, participation in research to the biology of trauma. What does it mean to think about community participation when you're studying trauma in a petri dish? Uh, next slide. So there are obviously many benefits, uh, increases capacity of all participants. Um, it's, I think, one of the best tools for trying to solve complex problems, which I'm guessing everyone on this call is working on every day. Um, and I think one of the things that most excites me as a researcher is there's a lot of research evidence that research is better uh, translated into practice and policy when the stakeholders are part of the process from the very beginning. Next slide. So I wanted to just really quickly mention uh, those of us at the Institute and, and lots of the faculty on this call have been involved or led participatory action research projects with community partners. And the way we think about it is a spectrum of approaches. We often talk about drawing on the principles of CBPR or PAR. Um, sometimes studies and uh, will use a CAB or an exact um, uh, an advisory board, right? Um, and for some studies, that's where they start. That's where community engagement goes. We've had a, a model called a consumer consulting group where we uh, hired and partnered with folks living with um, serious mental illness to help us think about the role of reading in the lives of people with serious mental illness. Um, we've used other models with Professor Beth Molnar where we've uh, done what we've called a data collection facilitator model where we had young adults who had graduated from a Boston Public School middle school program looking at dating violence prevention, facilitate data collection with other middle school students. Because kids were involved, um, they actually weren't the direct data collectors, but we figured out a way that they could facilitate having others uh, collect the data. And then we've done also sorts of other projects thinking about uh, how to increase community engagement in all phases of the research project. The one I wanted to really make sure I mentioned here is the Somali Youth Risk and Resilience Project. Some of you may know Professor Heidi Ellis. She's at Children's. She and I have collaborated for more than 20 years on a CBPR partnership with the Somali community, looking at issues of importance to them. Um, that ultimately grew to about 20 years of external funding and work in four cities, including Toronto, Minneapolis, Boston, and Portland and Lewiston. And in those projects, our questions were generated by our Somali community partners. And then we as consultants uh, really worked to, to create teams of academics that could help them answer those questions. Um, next slide. So just some things to consider, and then my colleague Carmel Sali is going to tell you a little bit more specifics about the Somali study. I wanted to put these up here up front early um, because CBPR creates many interesting things to consider, challenges, obstacles, learning edges, whatever level, language you want, um, but wanted to sort of name these up front early. Uh, next slide. All right, so I'm going to hand off to Carmel, and I will just say, despite all of us faculty on this call being folks who do community work all the time, we are still, I, I'll speak for me, still using too many slides and talking too much. Uh, but excuse me for my rapid pace as I try to get through this. So Carmel, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Elisa. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Carmel. I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Health Sciences at Northeastern and an affiliate faculty at the Institute for Health Equity and Social Justice Research. So what I'm gonna be doing is talking about the Somali uh, Youth Risk and Resilience Study as one example of the principles of CBPR that Elisa just presented. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm sharing our, our list of partners to show that the project was only made possible really through a broad range of university and community collaborations, uh, as well as a multidisciplinary investigative team. Uh, I'm going to be today. I'm going to be sharing the findings from two studies that specifically highlight how violence was is societally shaped uh, in in our um, among in the small communities in the U.S. and Canada using qualitative and quantitative methods that sort of Aidan Farrell also uh, talked about briefly. So next slide, please. Uh, so SILES uh, is a mixed method study with four waves of data collection that looked at Somalis aged 18 to 30 in the US and Canada. In terms of its CDPR approach, this design centered community ownership of the research topic, 
which means that it focused on understanding relationships between several, several factors that were important to Somali immigrants, including experiences of trauma, economic and social marginalization, uh, discrimination, as well as health and well-being. Uh, next slide, please. So one issue that uh, we focused on was experiences of violence for Somalis. A lot of the academic literature around refugees and immigrants looks at violence in relation to in relationship to the household, which centers interpersonal conflict but avoids broader context. And so what we wanted to do was to examine how Somalis experienced violence outside of their household. Uh, what we found uh, was that over 50% of our participants were exposed to violence outside of their household. And this was uh, associated with ongoing mental health symptoms, um, which you have to keep in mind, this is a, a, a group that had a lot of uh, conflict related experiences and these experiences post migration were more strongly related to, to the to mental health symptoms than those uh, during conflict, their experiences of conflict. Uh, so that survey data really helped us understand the prevalence of violence-related experiences. And with that, um, with that understanding, we wanted to look at how violence or experiences that caused harm to health and well-being were shaped by social and economic conditions. So we used qualitative interviews to understand the relationships between discrimination in employment and healthcare, health insurance, and health. And what we found was that not only did people experience discrimination while employed, but also that access to employment was shaped by their knowledge of which employers were more discriminatory. So that the, not only experiences the, of discrimination while in employment, but also the limitation of access to employment, in turn limited, limited access to uh, and the quality of the health insurance that our participants had, which then strained the health and the health management of, uh, of our of Somali communities. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to back to Elisa to wrap us up. Yep. So just wanted to end here. Uh, as we've been part of this partnership, we, Carmel and I, and, and lots of others have been thinking, is there an opportunity here for an immigrant health CBPR partnership or other types of issues that are of importance to our various communities? Uh, and so hoping to just sort of use some of the time in the second half of this to think about, are there matches between needs of our community partners and things they would like to learn about where, where increased knowledge would, would be helpful for advocacy or policy and the strengths of our teams. And so I wanted to share, these are some of our strengths um, at the Institute in our CBPR work, violence, trauma and health, healthcare utilization and access, mental health and well-being, experiences of stigma, discrimination and hate crime. But you'll hear from lots of others on this call. There's other many other strengths in the partnership. Um, so with that, last slide. This is how you can find uh, all of us. Suzanne Garverick is our fabulous program director at the Institute who's here today. Um, and we just really look forward to learning from you all and continuing conversations. Thank you very, very much, Elisa and Carmel. We turn now to our uh, second presentation under the heading of community partner research, supporting service providers and developing youth leadership are the tools we're going to discuss. And Isabel Martinez, who uh, specializes, among other things, in immigrant youth. Over to Isabel. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um... So thank you so much. Um, I am Isabel Martinez. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and I'm the director of Latinx and Latin American Caribbean Studies. Again, thanks, Elizabeth, for the introduction and invitation to participate in today's conference. Um, I'm a recent transplant to Boston from New York City by way of Texas, two spaces that have deeply influenced my research about and with, and with unaccompanied minors from Mexico and Central America, which we'll hear about in a minute. Slide two. So I started this research back in 2005 with a paper for a graduate level class about the life course after I noticed that the concepts that we were learning about did not fit what I was seeing just in my everyday but always, always sociological observations in New York City. I saw baby faced Mexican teens riding the subways late at night, but also working in the bodega aisles during what I knew were school hours. The idea is that 14 year olds would be living with their parents, going to school full time between the hours of 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. and working only in safe after school jobs were foreign to the youth who I would begin interviewing for my first paper, then dissertation and then book becoming transnational youth workers, independent Mexican teenage migrants and pathways of survival and social mobility. 
As I began to think about my next project, I would have the serendipitous opportunity to meet one of the leading legal scholars and advocates who writes about, but then actually does something about immigrant youth rights and pathways to citizenship in the United States. New York Law School Distinguished Chair of Immigration and Human Rights Law and Safe Passage Project Founding Director Lenny Benson, who's pictured there. After approaching her about the possibility of first supporting and then conducting research with her and her organization, Lenny and I found that we shared more than a passion for immigrant youth rights. We actually shared immigration histories that began with our teenage minor grandmothers leaving their parents behind, much like the youths who I wrote about and she and her team represented. While my grandmother would cross into the United States at the Reynosa Benitez border in South Texas and Northern Mexico at the age of 16, Lenny's grandmother arrived from present day Belarus to Ellis Island at the tender age of nine with her 11 year old brother. Slide three. Lenny would share that what, that what her organization, Safe Passage Project, which is a 501c3 that started as a legal clinic at New York Law School, and it provided free legal counsel to immigrant and refugee children who were being deported. What they needed most were young people who could interpret and translate for their lawyers, but also sim simply act as peer mentors to their clients. As such, ULAMP or the Unaccompanied Latin American Minor Project was born. In 2014, I founded ULAMP as a research and service program that provides academic, social, and legal support to recently arrived immigrant youths and their attorneys, as well as addresses the underrepresentation of Latinxes in the legal profession by exposing mostly first generation Latinx college students to immigration law. From 2014 to 2022, I focused primarily on the service and on developing trust with the organization. Nearly eight years after its founding, ULAMP boasts over 100 Spanish-speaking college students who have supported, and now graduates, who have supported Safe Passage Project and Catholic Charities in New York by calling clients, checking in on them, giving them advice about issues that teenagers care about, like making friends, but also providing much needed support to the youth legal, team, legal teams by reminding clients of important appointments and court dates, translating important documents like birth certificates, updating databases, but also interpreting during legal screening and medical evaluations. And after I began my collaboration with Catholic Charities program in New York, also called, well, Safe Passages, um, accompanying social workers on home visits, on the home visits that they're required to do prior to um, ORR releasing youths into, into households. Um, in these pictures, you see several events and activities that you Lampers engaged in. On the left, planning a holiday party for immigrant children, and on the right, drawing court sketches of the youths who appeared in court. And the uh, words on the second picture on the bottom say they found you a lawyer. And both were done by two U Lampers. It was not until 2020, right before the pandemic, that Safe Passage Project and I revisited the original idea of conducting research, and we decided that what would most be most helpful to Safe Passage Project, but also what I was interested in, would be an assessment of their former clients' experiences working with their attorneys with the idea of improving their services, <clears throat> but also gauging the former client's interests in co-creating and, and joining and or joining an advisory board <clears throat> to help guide organization practices. Disrupted by the pandemic, finally in spring 2022, eight years after my initial conversation with the founding director, Safe Passage Project staff, several ULAMPers and I began to co-design a mixed method study that would capture the client's experiences through focus groups, interviews, and surveys. Funded by the New York Community Trust, this past year, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. You can. My, uh, this past year, my research assistant and I launched the first phase of the Assessing Immigrant Youth Experiences with Legal Service Providers project, which included eight focus groups. Next slide, Elizabeth. I forgot to put. Um, for this phase, we focused on the following topics. How they discovered Safe Passage Project, the overall experiences they had with Safe Passage Project staff and attorneys, including respecting their cultures, how clients understood their cases, and the process of obtaining legal status, how they communicated with Safe Passage Project attorneys and staff, the needs of the clients during and after obtaining legal status, the impacts of obtaining a green card, and thoughts about an advisory board. 
We are currently in the midst of collecting feedback on our preliminary findings from staff and we'll begin phase two of our study by early May, which will include interviewing 60 set to 70 additional clients, attorneys and staff, but also collecting data through a short survey. We've already identified one finding that is being translated into a concrete practice, the need to provide standardized digital and or print materials to clients that give a broad overview of the process they will be embarking on. We have additional plans after the release of our final report to collaborate with clients, to former clients and current clients to facilitate the creation of advisory board. So stay tuned for that. Next slide, Elizabeth. And that's ULAMP. Um, if, um, if you're interested in collaborating or learning more about ULAMP, feel free to contact us by email, Twitter, or Facebook, or use a QR code or web address to learn more about us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Leave the QR code there for a second so people can snap it. Okay, so our next bucket of tools is legal tools. And I'll be offering the first presentation here on public records requests and collaborative databases. I will be talking about a safe communities project. So the safe communities project is housed in the program on human rights in the global economy. It started in 2017 uh, with the ACLU and Mira. So the tools I hope to talk about today are using data to support an advocacy goal, using law students to support research, using collaborative databases to share information with advocates and community groups, and using public records quests to gather data that would be useful to community organizations. So as you all know, in 2017, when Trump was articulating his um, plan for increasing enforcement of immigration policies inside the country, one of his primary objectives was to promote collaboration between local police and ICE. You don't need me to tell you that that sort of collaboration causes all kinds of harms, including harms to public safety, to health and public health, and to local economies. And so advocates had a goal of decreasing this collaboration between local police and ICE. And in Massachusetts, the ACLU and the MIRA, and MIRA, excuse me, both adopted this advocacy goal. How can we decrease collaboration between local police and ICE, this collaboration that's causing so much harm in immigrant communities? And what they did was they, they had a, a variety of approaches. One was to promote city and town policies that limit that kind of collaboration or state legislation that limits that kind of collaboration, the Safe Communities Act, or police policies that limit that collaboration. The idea is to promote all of those types of policies. And so Fergie went to the ACLU and Mira and said, how can we help? And we decided that what Fergie could do, because we can hire law students and work, have them work as interns, is we could really gather a lot of information about what was happening in Massachusetts on the issue of collaboration between local police and ICE in city and town policies and in police policies. So we had two research questions. The first, as Trump is coming into office and his administration is unfolding, are municipalities in Massachusetts passing local policies in reaction to Trump's immigration policies? Are they asking their police departments to limit collaboration with ICE? And our second question, to what extent do municipal police departments in Massachusetts have policies that limit collaboration with ICE? So that was our project. Phase one, municipal policies. Phase two, police policies. So under municipal policies, we were looking for policies that did one of two things express solidarity and welcome with immigrants, or had specific provisions that limited the collaboration of local police with ICE agents. And where did we look? Well, for cities, we looked at mayor's de declarations and executive orders, city council ordinances and resolutions. For towns, we looked at what select boards were doing, their policies and statements. And we looked at town meetings, bylaws, proclamations, and resolutions. Uh, we hired a lot of law students over the years. I, a couple dozen over the, over the last few years have worked on this. Um, and what they did to find these policies is web searches, social media searches, news database searches, phone calls to local officials. You would, when I first started this project, I thought, you know, we'll just Google this and we'll get the answer in a few minutes. But a lot of towns didn't want people knowing about their safe community or sanctuary policy. So it actually took a fair amount of work to get this stuff. 
And as we went, we set up collaborative and safe databases online that we could share with the ACLU and MIRA. We, we used these da databases with confidentiality agreements so that they were safe and locked down. The most important of the databases was the municipality database. And we had an entry for every single one of the towns and cities in Massachusetts, all 351. And we collected a lot of information about each one on the issue of safe community policies. Here's just a little screenshot of a tiny part of that database. It shows, and it's probably too small for you to see, that when we looked into Amherst, we found that they passed a a proposed bylaw in May of 2017. We found no activity whatsoever in Andover, but Aquina, we found that they passed uh, an Article 43 at their annual town meeting in May of 2017 as well. You can picture a large database. We put information here real time. The ACLU and MIRA can put information here real time. And we collaborated and found a lot of information. With one click of a button, you can make that same database show you the list of all the policies that we had found. And you can organize them by county or by type. So you can find out where are all the bylaws, where are all the ordinances, where are all the select board policies. And we also, with one click of the button, could convert that very big database into an alert system. So, for example, Laura let us know at one point um, that Winchester, there seemed to be activity on the ground. So I would let the interns know, and they would really look hard into Winchester at that part. Or we could put a note on the database saying, hey, City Council in Framingham just uh, passed a resolution saying they're going to create a task force to study the issue of whether they should become a sanctuary city. And this is how we kept each other informed, even though we're all very busy and didn't have time to exchange a thousand emails. So what did we find? 48 Massachusetts municipalities issued safe communities. Some issued more than one. This is during the Trump administration. 55 policies were issued in total, 12 in cities and 36 in towns. There they are on a map. And again, you will have these slides so you don't have to see all this quickly. Um, most of these policies were issued in the beginning, the first year or so of the Trump administration, which is something that we see across the country. And the question then becomes for us as we reflect on what happened with the municipal project is how is it that we were supporting advocates? We were doing it by sharing real-time information, by collecting information that could be used to change the hearts and minds of residents, policymakers, and legislators. If you can show that there are dozens and dozens of safe communities in Massachusetts and the sky did not fall, that can help you get more cities and towns to adopt these policies. We contributed testimony for the Safe Communities Act, and we are in the process of finalizing a large and detailed report on all of our findings on safe communities. So that takes us to the police, policy, police policies phase two of our research project. And here we took a different approach. Again, we hired a lot of law students and then we also used public records requests this time around. So if you wanna look at a government uh, document from a government agency and it's a federal agency, you'll turn to the Freedom of Information Act. I'm sure you've all heard of FOIA requests, but if you're trying to get uh, government documents from Massachusetts agencies, you use the public records recall public records law here, which is what we did. And this is our process. We developed a pub public records request with the ACLU. We sent it to every single police department in Massachusetts. We are managing replies and following up as necessary and analyzing the relevant policies. We received thousands of policies because a lot of police departments said, you want our policies, here's all of them. Um, and we found 131 in total and we that are relevant from 96 police departments, and we are working on making this information relevant for our advocacy partners, and it has been a joy working with them. Thank you very much. Now I would like to turn everything over to our second legal tools presentation, Law Student Support of Advocacy Research. My colleague, Heyman Gundavaram from the Immigrant Justice Clinic and uh, Legal Skills and Social Context Program. Over to you, Heyman. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> I am the director of the Immigrant Justice Clinic here at the law school um, and a clinical professor. Um, previously, I had taught in the LSSC program. I'm going to talk a little bit about both of those. Um, in the Immigrant Justice Clinic, like any law school clinic, uh, we have me as the supervisor. I uh, typically take eight students, um, eight to 10 students in a semester. Um, and the students work about 25 hours per week in the clinic. They get credits for it. Um, I also usually have um, probably two TAs per semester as well. And the clinic typically runs twice per year for four months. Um, and so students are spending a, a great deal of time 
um, in the clinic 25 hours a week times, you know, 14 weeks. Um, so it's a great deal of time, a lot of students, and we're able to do um, a significant amount of work. Um, typically, the work has been um, direct client relations and uh, asylum representation. So um, most of our cases are asylum cases. Um, in the past, when the clinic opened in 2017, I uh, opened the clinic with Professor Rosenblum. Um, we took a lot of local clients, Boston-based clients, and, and worked um, the whole semester to work on kind of a two students per case um, and working on one case. For the last um, couple of years during the pandemic, um, we have been doing a lot more border remote work. Um, and that remote work has involved um, helping people file asylum applications for their one year border, um, one year uh, deadline at the border. Um, we've been able to do that um, as meeting the needs of kind of a current crisis. Um, that's really been the focus of the clinic more recently. Uh, it allows us to work on more cases as well. Um, so students typically will now work on two or three cases. Um, but we have done other um, types of work as well beyond the direct uh, asylum representation work. We've done a lot of Know Your Rights um, presentations to local organizations. We're also currently organizing a trip to the border with six students um, in May. Um, and then I wanted to talk specifically about a research project that we did. Um, this was a few years ago in 2018. Um, it was uh, blocking the courthouse doors, ICE enforcement at Massachusetts courthouses and its effect on the judicial process. And I'm just going to um, put that in the chat if that works. Um, but this was the report we did. We worked with students. Um, Professor Rosenblum led this project. Um, but it was a collaboration between us, all uh, eight clinic students, and um, a dozen attorneys, um, local attorneys. And so this was a combination, this report came from a combination of student uh, observations at court to see if ICE um, was entering courthouses and making arrests, interviews of non-citizens, and interviews of criminal defense attorneys. Um, so um, this is the kind of thing um, the clinic would love to do again in the future. So this kind of thing. And the students are very, very, typically the clinic students are, are fairly advanced and know a lot about immigration work. And so they're able to um, jump right in and do um, substantive work. And so because the clinic has tried to stay nimble and flexible with um, current needs, um, the clinic is running this summer, this summer, this fall as a practicum next summer and next fall. So, you know, summer 2023 might be too soon, but summer 2024 certainly um, would be an opportunity for clinic students to work on um, a research project in addition to their direct client representation casework. Um, wanted to switch gears and talk a little bit about the legal skills in social context program. Um, so first that I used to teach in, um, it's a first year law student course. It's really one of a kind in the country. It combines legal writing with a social justice project. Um, every school, every law school has a legal writing program, but not every school, really don't know of any other school that has this kind of social justice program where students write from when they start law school, essentially work in a policy clinic. Um, LSSC professors engage uh, an organization with a project um, that that organization needs. Um, some sort of research project and writing project. Um, students work um, in teams of about 15 students for the whole year on this project um, from September to May. Um, areas of interest vary across various public interest fields, but um, typically one or two of the LSSC professors out of about nine or 10 of the professors work on immigration. For example, when I used to teach in and I did immigration, there's a couple of um, professors who um, focus on immigration. So the project would take about eight months or so, um, but you have 15 students um, working on the project all through the year. They will do interviews, research, field uh, research and fact investigation, and then um, engaging with experts and then writing a, a report. Um, just to give you a couple of examples of reports from the last couple of years, um, just recently, the LSSC program worked with the Prisoners 
Legal Services, PLS, um, on a project called A Dream Deferred, the Problematic Use of Solitary Confinement on Immigrants in Detention in Massachusetts. The, we call them law offices, the student groups. Um, law Office 5 examined the issue of immigrant detainees in solitary confinement in Massachusetts. The students created a white paper detailing the standards for deta detaining immigrants, um, analysis of legal rights, analysis of effects of solitary confinement, and info on its use on immigrants at county jails in Massachusetts. Um, and the purpose of this was to inform PLS efforts to advocate for the end of solitary confinement um, use to house detained immigrants in Massachusetts. Um, two other projects that I'll mention quickly, both were with the ACLU of Southern California. So again, because of, you know, I think uh, because of the nature of Zoom and all the advancements we've had, um, as you can see by this conference, uh, the LCC program is able to represent and work with organizations anywhere. Um, but two other projects they worked on were with the ACLU of Southern California, one was defending dreamers model pleadings for DACA recipients in removal proceedings. So um, even in direct client representation and litigation, they can, the groups can make model pleadings um, that attorneys can use. And the other one was fulfilling the promise of the California Values Act, putting California values into action. Um, that was drafting a comprehensive report on California value, the California Values Act, which is the first statewide sanctuary law that significantly restricts the ability of state and local law enforcement to assist federal immigration enforcement, which is something that's been brought up a few times today. Um, LSSC program, this is like a really good time to be thinking about this. They're finishing up their year, and then um, the LSSC professors typically spend uh, the summer um, figuring out their projects for the next academic year. I'm just going to put um, the LSSC program information also in the chat. There's actually a part um, on the page for, yeah, let me look for that. I'll look for the report, um, Amy, on the California Values Act. I'll ask the professor who has that to get that report. Um, and then this um, link takes you to the LSSC program, which has a link um, that you'll see four organizations to um, apply. It says information for partners. Um, and that's a part um, where you can reach out to the um, organizer and uh, administrative head of the LSSC program um, to show your interest. Um, last thing I'll say is um, we have a Flex JD program, which is our full-time um, ABA accredited part. Well, sorry. Uh, the full-time program isn't for everybody. And so the law school um, developed the Flex JD program, which is an ABA accredited part-time um, online program um, with working professionals. And we're currently looking um, for projects for those students to work on there. Those students are typically older than um, the average law student, have more um, work experience, um, but could work in groups um, to meet the needs of an organization to work on some sort of research project. So that's another thing we're exploring. So a lot of opportunities at the law school um, to have our students work on this um, important research. Thank you very, very much, Hamid. I appreciate your joining us and uh, thank you for all that information. Um, our third and final presentation under the heading of legal tools is convenings amicus is will address the following tools convenings amicus briefs public comments and testimony it will be, pre be presented by mayreen butt from the center for health policy and law over to mayreen hi everyone and thank you elizabeth and the organizers for um this conference so as elizabeth said i'm mayreen butt i'm the managing director for the center of health law and policy our faculty director is Wendy Parmet. Um, many of you have worked with her on health policy and law issues. Uh, she's not here because she's teaching a class right now. Um, Wendy was on the board of Health Law Advocates and Healthcare for All, and I previously, a long time ago, worked at Healthcare for All. Um, and I've worked on many of our issues with the ACLU and MIRA, including the Roe Act and the driver's license bill. It's actually nice to see some friendly faces. So hi, uh, Jonathan and Liv and Kate. Nice to see you again on Zoom calls. Um, so at CHIPL, we work on a wide array of health policy issues, including areas in public health law, health and human rights, healthcare financing, and drug law. 
Um, we have this great grant funded program where we're teaching social determinants of health to judges. We partner with Elisa Lincoln, who you heard from earlier, and we've trained over 400 judges thus far. Um, so I just put a list of other ways that we could partner together and um, I'm relatively new, so I'm still learning. I kind of went through our files about how we had kind of collaborated uh, collaborated with some of you in the past. So we do convenings. So we're really good at gathering together interest those people interested in kind of like today. Um, but we've gathered experts and had them write a policy paper, policy um, positions. So we wrote a COVID-19 policy playbook, which had recommendations for a safer and more equitable world post-COVID. And I'll put the link in the chat of where you can find that. Um, we can do legal searches, like everyone else kind of said before me. You know, what I love about working at Chipple is that we have these students, law students, who are so eager to work on health law issues. Um, so if you have a legal research uh, that you need done, let us know. We um, you know, we've partnered and researched on issues, legal issues in the past. Uh, next on the list is amicus briefs. So we helped draft amicus briefs. Uh, the last time we did one was 2019. We submitted one on the public charge rule changes. Um, and I think we worked with that uh, with um, health law advocates and maybe healthcare for all. Um, and then uh, public comments. So we can help write and submit public comments uh, on regulations and guidances on both the state and federal level. In 2018, we partnered with Health Law Advocates and submitted comments on New Hampshire's request to extend its New Hampshire Health Protection Program under um, Section 115 of the Social Security Act. And finally, testimony. So if you need help, drafting testimony for bills at either the state or federal level, let us know, particularly if they affect health insurance changes to um, immigrant and immigrant communities, we can help with that. Those are just some of the ways that I'm thinking about how in the future we can collaborate together and happy to discuss further. Thank you so very much, Maureen. I appreciate it. Um, and that concludes our presentation on legal tools. We'll now move to our last bucket of tools, working with and using data. We'll have two presentations. The first, we'll talk about the following tools, qualitative interviews in multiple languages, testimony and op-eds, um, and presenting will be Tiffany Joseph, uh, and she'll be talking about language access and healthcare. Over to you, Tiffany. Hi, good morning, everyone. So I'll be talking a little bit about, as Elizabeth said, language access and healthcare um, from providing some findings from a qualitative research project that I've been working on over the last decade. Next, Elizabeth. All right, so um, as I said, I've been working on a research project looking at Boston immigrants' healthcare access over the last decade. Next, Elizabeth. And for that project, I was really interested in trying to understand how immigrants' access to healthcare shifted over time amid major policy shifts in immigration and health policy at the federal and state level. So these questions were the ones that were the foundation of my research in terms of wanting to find out these particular or explore these particular issues around healthcare access for immigrants. But in the interest of time today, I'm going to focus a little bit on question two around the role of language in that process and how that was a really big barrier to care for the populations I did research with. Next slide. Uh, for this project, I did 207 interviews with three major stakeholder groups in the greater Boston area. Next slide. And I primarily focused on immigrants from Brazilian, Dominican, and Salvadoran communities because those are three of the largest immigrant groups in the Boston area. They're from different parts of Latin America. They have a range of documentation statuses. And also in terms of physical features in the US, these groups are racially categorized or placed in different categories. And so I really wanted to find out how these various factors were shaping their access to healthcare in the Boston area. I also interviewed a range of healthcare providers at what I refer to as the Boston Health Coalition because I wanted to find out from their perspective how these policy changes affected their ability to provide care to their uh, immigrant patients and the challenges those patients face. And lastly, to get a better sense of the role of the socio-political climate in Greater Boston and how it shaped immigrants' healthcare access, I also interviewed a range of employees from various immigrant and health advocacy organizations. At three different time periods that coincided with major policy shifts, 
uh, particularly in health policy. Um, I started the study in 2012 under what was in the Massachusetts health reform, which actually had more access to coverage at the state level, regardless of documentation status for people living in the state of Massachusetts. But once the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare was implemented in 2015, uh, was implemented, um, federal restrictions on documentation status, we configured access to coverage. And I wanted to find out the impact of that in the Boston area for immigrants. And then lastly, a lot of people have been talking about the Trump era. Um, I also wanted to find out in this study how policy proposals by the Trump administration in both immigration and health policy were potentially reconfiguring or shaping the decisions that immigrants made about their health care locally. Next slide. So to move on to some of the findings of this project, um, I just really want to highlight that qualitative research is really important because a lot of times we hear various statistics about health care. So for instance, in Massachusetts, it's estimated that 97% of the population has access to coverage. Um, but what's missing in those numbers is, well, what are the challenges people might face to accessing that coverage? And so in my project, one of the things I found was that language was really crucial because a lot of the paperwork and assistance at the state level level is in English. And so a health advocate I interviewed talked about how when he helps people apply for coverage, that most of that paperwork, the correspondence is in English. And this is really a challenge for people trying to figure out how to um, apply for coverage and to keep their coverage. Similarly, Romina, a Salvadoran immigrant I interviewed, spoke about how language was a barrier to her not only applying for co coverage, but receiving adequate health care. Next slide. Next. Another way that language came up in the study uh, was through navigating our very complicated healthcare system in the US. So not only is uh, speaking English one of the things that can help you apply for coverage, um, but also it's important to understand that there's a lot of jargon just in terms of figuring out how our system works. So Jenny, a health advocate I spoke with, talked about how people often don't understand what's a deductible, a copay, or a premium. Uh, and because of a lot of this language and the complexity of our system, it's really hard for people to make informed decisions about their health care and insurance. And similarly, Julia, another advocate that I interviewed, spoke about how a lot of times when people are engaging with the system, most of that happens in English. If you get a phone call from the hospital or in your medical record after you meet with the provider, those notes are often in English. So if English is not your first language or you have limited English proficiency, again, this is a big barrier to understanding what's going on with your health and being able to effectively advocate for yourself and navigate the system. Next. And then lastly, one of the really crucial ways that this came out um, around language access was in, in interactions with healthcare providers. So Francisca, a Brazilian immigrant that I interviewed, talked about how her husband uh, speaks very little English and how, because he needs a medical interpreter, he often has to wait two or three months to make appointments because that delays his ability to see a provider. So just imagine if you have a pressing medical issue um, and you have to delay the time that you can see a doctor because a medical interpreter isn't available. So this becomes a barrier to people receiving the proper care um, and a really big challenge to people. Next slide. So in terms of us being here at this conference today and thinking about the role of research from data or data and researchers and thinking about the work of organizations meeting the needs of uh, various communities, um, currently around this issue, issue of language access, uh, there's the Language Inclusion Act, which is actually moving through the State House now in Massachusetts. And I want to briefly acknowledge Mira for this handout that I found on their website, which talks about limited English proficiency among Massachusetts residents and how, you know, these numbers are really important because they give us a sense of the languages that are spoken and the language diversity. But some of the quotes that I provided in thinking about the role of qualitative research is really important for giving voice to the experiences of people that are experiencing this on the ground every day, the lack of proper language access to navigating their health care. And this sort of information, these sorts of voices and experiences are important for providing compelling public testimony for legislators to sway them in supporting this kind of legislation and also informing the general public through op-eds and other types of public, um, public engaged publications too, because it's really important to have the public calling their legislators to support um, legislation like the Language and Inclusion Act. And so this is really one of the benefits of thinking about how you can leverage qualitative data 
for being able to advocate on behalf of the communities that a lot of that we are very passionate about. Next slide. And just to close and thinking about us being here at this conference today, I wanted to bring everyone's attention to this yield giving open call, particularly the organizations present, um, because um, this particular funding opportunity aims to give $1 million to 250 organizations for unrestricted use. Um, from my research with the range of organizations over the last decade, but also as a researcher, one of the things that is often needed to do research and one of the things that organizations need to provide services to their constituents is funding and money to do that. And so in terms of this particular opportunity, if any of the organizations here um, meet these eligibility criteria, this is a really possible important opportunity to think about how we can leverage the opportunities from this conference today, some of the discussions that we're having to being able to conduct research that better serves a number of the communities that are represented or the organizations that are represented on this call today. So there's a link there for more information. Um, and I look forward to having more of our, we're discussing more of this in the next session. Next slide, next slide. And here's my contact information if people want to get in touch with me. Thank you all so much. Thank you very, very much, Tiffany. Um, these supplemental slides, I'll just move through those. They're, they will be there for you uh, when you get the slides in a few days. And so now our last presentation, again, under the heading of working with and using data, this will address the tools data collection and visualization. And I will be turning it over to Amy Farrell and Carlos Cuevos, who are experts in hate crimes and trafficking. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Carlos Cuevas. I am a professor in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Um, I am also the uh, co-director of the Center on Crime, Just Race, and Justice, and with Amy, I'm the co-director of the Violence Justice Research Lab. Um, and um, the presentation today is actually just going to sort of use um, our hate crime project as sort of an example, really about how do we communicate this information. Uh, I think one of the things that um, we've realized is that, you know, when you're an academic and you write manuscripts for your research, the only people that really read those are other academics who need to cite your research to then write their research. Um, and so this is really about how do we actually communicate this information to uh, service providers, sort of people working within these communities in a sort of effective, useful, sort of efficient way. Um, so that they don't have to sit there and read our long, boring academic articles. <laughs> um, uh, next slide. So as a way of providing some context, I'm just going to give a little bit of background on this research study and then really just provide some very simple examples about some of the ways we sort of started to present these, this work. Um, we did a project where we looked at um, hate, uh, hate crime and bias victimization directed at the uh, Latinx community, Latinx adults. Um, is a project that was across three different locations here in the Boston area, uh, San Diego area, Southern California, and then the Southern Texas sort of Houston Galveston area, which is where our research partners were. Um, the, um, the work was really sort of, um, I, I think highlighted a few important things. Um, one is that any research that is really going to get at that community immigrant communities, all these sort of folks that we're talking about working with um, is going to be on the ground data collection. Um, national surveys, online surveys, all those methodologies are really not going to get to the folks that I think we want to learn from and want to hear from. Um, so we, you know, all our research teams, we would, you know, go out to different community agencies to recruit participants, you know, churches, um, the local festivals, which, um, you know, the Columbia Festival, Puerto Rican Festival, which by the way, none of our grad students ever complained about doing data collection there because it's hard to be upset when there's like chicharron empanadas available to you. Um, so, uh, and really we can just pay them with that. Um, but it is one of the things where it's imp extremely important because um, we realized they need to see that we are sort of you know, in some ways, part of the community. Um, 
much of our team was bicultural, uh, much of our team was bilingual, and it really made it that they could sort of trust saying, okay, we're gonna answer these questions. And we were asking some very sensitive questions about hate crime, about victimization, about immigration status, all these things. And it was really important that they sort of saw who we were and that we weren't just some random link on some website somewhere. Um, and so I think this kind of work is really on the ground research. Um, so that's one key aspect, I think, of, of the data collection. Um, and then the other piece um, is that um, really communicating this to the folks that can use this information is really important. So finding ways to not only disseminate the information in sort of more effective, sort of, uh, you know, sort of succinct, uh, accessible ways is really something that we've actually been working to do for quite some time now, because we realize that, um, that the only way this sort of research can actually be useful and make a difference is if it's accessible to all the people that kind of can benefit from the information. Um, and so for a lot of the agencies we work with, we would send them sort of a brief sort of summary report that was very straightforward and simple in terms of the key points. Um, they could always sort of ask us for the, sort of the, the other stuff but it was really the, hey, here's the highlights of our research. It was, I think, one or two pages, very visual, so that, hey, those are the key points. That's information that can be useful to us working with the community. And we just sent it to anybody who wanted it. And we sent it to even people who didn't want it or didn't ask for it. Um, and it was a great way to sort of share that information, both with the partners that we, re the, the, the agencies we partner with for research, but anybody working with that community. Um, so that's a little bit of the context about the project. So I'm going to just kind of give a few examples about sort of just more visual ways to do this. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So a lot of times, even just simple things. So this is actually talking about the increase in hate crime over the, the essentially the time period prior to around the time we started the project. And a lot of times, you know, academics are really good at making really complicated tables that nobody likes to look at. I make those tables, I don't want to look at them. And so a lot of times, just very simple visualizations, when even presenting simple numbers like that, makes it much more digestible, much easier to sort of just glance at it and go, oh, hey, hate crime went up a lot, but it really went up a lot for the Latinx community, um, which was one of the key pieces in terms of sort of why we were interested in doing this project, which was we'd been seeing an increase in hate crime, but certain communities, including the Latinx community, were disproportionately burdened with that increase. So that was one of the things that we sort of said, okay, we need to highlight that point. Here's a simple way to do it. Um, next slide. One of the other things we were really interested in is that the project really wanted, needed to look at not only the, the sort of hate crime, bias motivated sort of um, victimizations that these folks experienced, but also sort of putting that in the context of all the other sort of non-biased, non-hate crime victimization experiences they, they encountered. And that's really sort of in some ways important because we know that cumulative effect tends to have a more negative impact on individuals. And one of the things we're interested in is, well, how much are these things overlapping? Um, and again, sort of simple visualizations make the point a lot easier than if I showed you the, a bunch of tables with you know, risk ratios and things like that. Um, and one of the things we were seeing is there is a, a vast, a huge overlap in terms of the experience of bio-motivated victimization and all the other sort of non-bias um, victimization experiences, which is really important in violence victimization research because we haven't historically asked about biased events, at least not in this level of detail. And I think when we looked at some of the general rates, I think a lot of times when we ask about, hey, have you been physically assaulted? And we don't ask about whether that was bias motivated, we're sort of losing the uniqueness that somebody's experiencing that and it was a bias motivated event just as opposed to sort of a non-bias motivated assault. Um, uh, next slide. Thanks. Um, again, simple visualizations is you know, this basically gives you the breakdown of the a sample of participants in our study is about 910 participants um, in terms of the gender breakdown, immigrant, non-immigrant, 
preferred language. Um, again, uh, uh, sort of in some uh, sort of re-emphasizing Tiffany's point. Um, you know, we offer the survey in either English or Spanish. Participants select the language they want to complete it in um, at the beginning of the survey. Um, and it was, you know, pretty close to a 50-50 split, um, which we tend to get with adults. With younger folks, you tend to get a more um, sort of higher rate for of, of uh, preferred uh, English. But with the adult uh, population, with this, with these communities, again, we were sort of recruiting from the community. Um, it, you, you know, you can't, the, the, the days of monolingual surveys in general, in my opinion, I think are gone. I think any research of any kind that doesn't include some of the major languages of the immigrant groups that are in the US are essentially, I think, uh, missing a huge part and probably biased in a lot of ways. Um, that's sort of my, my, my feeling on the issue. Um, uh, uh, next slide. Um, we looked at a lot of different factors. The project looked at the, you know, uh, the impact on mental health, uh, the degree to which participants sought uh, help for the bias victimization experiences they had. I, I am happy to share the multitude of other presentations or papers that we have that sort of detail all this. Um, but the simple number is that about half of the participants we met with had experienced some form of bias victimization or hate crime in their lifetime. In the past year, 25% of them did. Needless to say, we then did a second wave of data collection with the same uh, sample of participants. Um, so we got a second grant that funded the second wave of data collection. And unsurprisingly, but sadly, all those numbers went up and they went up a lot. Um, I think one of the key pieces, one of the other key pieces from that project, and again, simple ways, visual ways to represent them is that um, a lot of the sort of official statistics from the Uniform Crime Reports that talk about the hate crime rates, um, even if we just talk about hate crime, it, the, the, the calculation we did based on our, the rates that we got of, of hate, uh, hate uh, things, a uh, bias victimization that would qualify as a hate crime, um, essentially those official statistics are probably showing you about one nine thousandths of the victimization experiences that the, that the police of this community experiences. Um, it is a massively underreported problem. Um, when we looked at the help seeking rates, they were sort of abysmally low. And there are multiple re reasons for that. Um, you all can sort of probably figure what some of them are, but fear, distrust, of official authorities. Um, a lot of our qualitative uh, work that uh, Amy headed up really highlighted um, how much sort of folks were just, you know, sort of pulled back from everyday activities because of concerns about this. Um, we even had one of the qualitative interviews that I was, that I did with one of our uh, research assistants. Uh, the participant actually said that her friends had told her not to come do this interview because they thought we were um, an ICE uh, sting operation. Um, and mind you, we were doing the interviews in, in the space of one of the community agencies that, that were in the neighborhood. Um, so again, um, the other tricky thing uh, for us, um, next slide please, is trying to then also visually present more complicated uh, sort of analyses. I think one of the things is that we get to answer really interesting questions doing some sort of more complicated analytic techniques that not everybody wants to see, not everybody wants to sort of um, necessarily get into the weeds. And so one of the things we found, and this is actually more an example of sort of the, the, the research question than the actual results, um, is finding, again, visual ways that highlight what are the key results in those types of analyses. One of the things we looked at was, um, looking at the role that bias victimization had, like I said, in a number of outcomes. But one of the things we actually were interested in is also looking about around whether we, we saw any changes in terms of political uh, engagement, political participation, uh, and political perception of sort of the, the government. Um, again, being you know somebody who, who in his younger, uh, in his youth grew up in, in Chile and had, uh, I'll refer to them as activist parents, um, we're, we're really good at 
protesting or having a revolution every so often. Um, and so, you know, sort of looking at some of these questions around the degree to which the experience of bias victimization um, impacted the degree to which folks sort of trusted the government, voted, got engaged in political um, activities um, was sort of, you know, an interesting question. And again, visually showing kind of how what we found is really the most effective way to communicate it. Um, and so a lot of the sort of different ways of visualizing are things that we've started to do more of. We're actually probably still, I think, to some degree, given what I've seen some other folks do, I think we're still a little bit sort of the novices in this. But the value of presenting data in that way for mass distribution and really to get sort of the, the, the word out about kind of what we're seeing in our research I think is incredibly important when you are trying to put this in front of policy folks, put this in front of government officials, put this in front of providers. Um, the last uh, uh, piece I will say, and talk a little bit sort of going forward advanced visualization, um, the next slide. Um, so this is actually, so this is from, I, this is actually from the folks at can be, and I, um, somebody sort of showed it to me a while back and I threw it in here because I thought that this is just sort of a very fitting for this uh, presentation because it's um, a essentially sort of tree rings of US immigration uh, based on or sort of uh, birth origin. Um, and then if you look at the color code at the bottom right, it kind of shows you how that has shifted over the years. Um, and this is from the folks at Camdy. If you go to their website, you can kind of find it. It's I, I sort of somebody I came across it a while ago and I sort of really liked it. And I think it's the kind of thing that you can kind of look at and go, at least I did go, wow, that is a really like great way to show the immigration shifts across the years in the US. And it is a really kind of complicated data that you look at and go, oh. Yep, nope, I see how things went. Um, so one of the things that we're sort of, I think is, a, is more of resource is starting to learn about how do, how do we do this? Um, yeah, bars and circles and all that is nice, but some of the sort of other ways that people are doing this is really, in my opinion, kind of just really impressive and really impactful and useful. Um, so one of the things I sort of uh, talk about is you know, some of the simpler things, there's a lot of like alternatives to things like PowerPoint out there. Uh, some websites uh, people have heard of, VizMe, Prezi, uh, websites like that are um, really helpful in terms of having a, a much more visual approach to making presentation slides and things like that. Um, and then partnering with people who do this for a living, folks at Camdy, um, sort of other colleagues who really sort of specialize in taking really boring tables with co-regression coefficients and things like that and turning them into visual presentations that make the point, make it clear, make it concise, and make it really useful for everybody else other than the other academics that like to look at regression tables. Um, so anyway, that's that's sort of that was our project. I'm happy to share more about about the research itself, but essentially this presentation was really sort of my plug for um, how do we present this stuff with pretty pictures so people will actually look and listen. Thank you very much, Carlos. Carlos Camdi, College and Arts Media and Design. Is that yes, sorry? Yes, College of Arts Media and Design. Yes, I recommend. Uh, Googling it, as Carlos said, these sorts of things are are just so awe-inspiring. And as Amy Grunder has noted in the chat, these can be very, very helpful. All of the sorts of visualizations you mentioned can be helpful for convincing legislators to pass the bills we need them to pass. So before we take a break, we are going to take a quick poll, and I'm going to turn things over to Laura. Um, Okay. Wrote to low. Okay, so when you want me to launch, just say launch. Okay, so um, thank you all for sticking with us. Um, I hope that you've gotten some great information, some ideas are starting to churn in your head. 
I just want to set the stage for what comes next. Now, of course, you cannot be even in a Zoom room with a bunch of researchers and not be made to take a survey, right? So it's a, it's a little Zoom poll. It won't hurt, I promise. Um, but we do want to get a sense of, you know, what you're learning, what you're coming in with, because the next piece is that we're going to go into breakout groups. You will notice that we did not have a formal question and answer session here, and that's because we really want to have some good um, facilitated conversations around these issues in breakout groups. So we will be putting you all into five different breakout groups, and each breakout group is going to have somebody from Northeastern, at least one, maybe two, somebody from the partnership, from the ACLU or Mira, a moderator who's going to guide you through some questions for you know ease of conversation, and a note taker. We will not be recording the breakout group, so you can just talk freely, but we will take notes that will not have your names on it, unless you want them to have your names on it. Um, but we do want to get you know the learnings, as they say, uh, learnings leave, stories stay, right? So feel free to speak freely in your workout groups. Um, our note taker will not take down your names unless you like. So we're going to go into the breakout groups. Um, what else? Before we're going to take a 10 minute break. So before you do, we're going to just ask you to fill out this poll so that we, we get a sense of who's here. So you can go ahead and launch the poll now, Elizabeth. Um, and, and one last not, note. Of, yeah, go right, ahead. Okay. Do not close out of Zoom. Please stay on because that will make sure that you get into the right breakout group. So just, you know, do the poll, take a break, come back in 10 minutes. It's now, I have it at 11.28. So we'll come back at 11.38, uh, take a look at the results of the poll and go into our breakout. 